Well, welcome to the Water Resources and uh, IWeeWe Seminar Series. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Neil Farmer as our speaker today. He holds a, a BS from the uh, College of Southern Idaho and an MS from the University of Idaho. And he's got uh, many decades of experience and, uh, and study looking at the uh, Hagerman and some of the springs in Southern Idaho that I'm really glad he's gonna share with us today. So take it from here. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Robert. Thank you everyone for your time and attention. I think we've got some uh, good information to provide today to uh, folks. Um, uh, just a little audio video test. I assume everybody can see a, a rainbow on your screen and can hear me all right. Is that correct from anybody? Okay, got a thumbs up. Great. Um, so this is uh, uh, a continuation of uh, information and data that's been gathered since about year 2008. And one of the reasons is uh, this geologic contact is a major hydrogeological control of how the springs uh, uh, issue from the East Snake Plain Aquifer in South Central Idaho. I did, uh, uh, I do have a, a Google Earth file uh, with pins of all these springs. Um, we didn't get that out to everybody uh, uh, prior to the um, uh, presentation, but I, I do have, of course, a map. But if, if you do want that Google pin file, uh, let uh, Robert I know and we'll try and get that to you, to you as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> on your screen, you'll see a surface and it's the geologic contact between overlying uh, quaternary or young uh, geologic sediments and uh, underlying uh, lower uh, permeability sediments. And it has some major controls um, for how groundwater moves. And so the next many slides, and I do have quite a few, I'm going to try and push through them as, as fast as possible. And um, uh, we might try and hold, usually I like questions during presentation, but I've got so much to get through, uh, we may have to hold them uh, until after the presentation or chat session or something. This is the uh, study area in South Central Idaho. It's near the towns of Gooding, Wendell, and uh, also Bliss at this location. Uh, all these red dots are um, control points that are used in the uh, 3D model of the QT surface. We'll, I'll get into that acronym here in a second. And 86% of these uh, control points are within two miles of a uh, mapped outcrop. Uh, the series of slides will start up in the Niagara Springs area, travel down the Snake River Canyon, and touch on a number of springs, uh, not all of them, but a number of them, uh, through the canyon all the way to Bancroft out here to the west. And um, uh, the modeled area is this uh, stippled line area and um, uh, and then this is overlaying on a uh, just a colorized uh, uh, NED or DEM map. The model uh, w uh, used 86 contacts mapped by a number of different entities and 123 uh, ground truth well drilling logs and um, 73% of those were GPS. 86% of them are within two miles of a mapped QT contact. Uh, we'll get into the QT in just a second. Um, and along with 19 springs that have been all mapped, ground truth and GPS on site for a total of about 229 control points. Some of our methods were just foot surveys, um, hand augering, literally track hose, uh, excavations, road work exposures, fossil examinations in outcrops, and uh, we combined that with the well drilling information, uh, entered that into Rockware software and Surfer software to uh, create the information and produce a, a surface, subsurface, and um, then used that to evaluate against uh, Harold Maldi and Harold Stearns and uh, geologic mapping as well as water table mapping, groundwater chemistry, and, and groundwater tracer tests to see how close it matches. And we also used high accuracy, vertical accuracy GPS 
and laser transit. There's been a lot of studies starting in, since about 1900 and Israel uh, Russell started in 1900 and then Harold Stearns in the 20s and 30s, Howard Powers uh, in the 50s and 60s roughly. And these are just general time periods, um, Covington, Whitehead, Weaver, uh, in, and also Harold Maldi, all covering uh, different time periods. And uh, these are all USGS uh, scientists. Uh, surficial mapping by the same entities as well as the Idaho Geological Survey, uh, Virginia Gillerman and others. And then key reports listed here that uh, uh, discuss and describe uh, this uh, geologic uh, contact and, and formations. One th Israel Russell issued a report in 1902 and, uh, by the USGS. And one thing that's kind of interesting to me is he, he labels it as a geological reconnaissance and not a detailed survey. But then he wrote an over 215 page report with actually a lot of detail uh, in it. So it was kind of interesting. But he was wondering back then if uh, this uh, uh, lake bed deposits disappeared under the lava flows in the presence of the central and eastern plain. And he wrote a section on page 29 about the possible eastward extension of tertiary sedimentary beds um, and, and how they may extend underneath the basalt flows on the eastern Snake River Plain. And, um, and then Harold Stearns came in in 36 and he put some more work to it. Uh, Russell kind of identified it and theorized it. Um, Stearns came in and did some more work and identified the processes uh, involved with some of the canyon filling lavas. So we had ancest ancestral um, uh, canyons that uh, were carved into these older rocks and sediment, and then later filled with more younger, more permeable uh, basalts. And there's numerous displacements that occurred. He put forth a model where you would have a cut valley that filled and then another cut valley and it would push that Snake River further and further south. That's why the Snake River was located on the south boundary and not central to the plain as most rivers. And, and that uh, those valleys would fill from volcanic eruptions of basalt flows into those valleys. Harold Maldi came in and did a, a he was in my opinion, a heavy hitter in, under, in defining uh, these paleo channels and, and canyons and started mapping them out. Uh, Stearns identified the processes and some of the locations and Stearns started or Maldi started mapping those out in the sequence of which, so in one of his publications, he has like Canyon number one, two, three, four, five, uh, and, and uh, map those out. Um, interesting to some degree is Maldi um, uh, uh, was drafted in the Navy in 1942. He was gonna be a pilot and lost his eye. And uh, then he went to college and got his degrees and uh, did his entire geologic career uh, with only one eye, which is pretty amazing. He died in 2007, but uh, he was a real heavy hitter. And these channels, we're gonna look at these, number two, three, four, especially uh, in this presentation. Whitehead and Lindholm in 1985 with the USGS, they came in through the RASA project and drilled some deep wells. This is a thousand foot well where they actually identified specific uh, geologic formations in that well. So that's one of a key control point uh, for the modeling purposes. So really what we're looking at is the contact between younger Snake River group and older Idaho group rock formations, uh, but it's generally the quaternary tertiary boundary at this area. And the uh, younger rocks, the Snake River group, are highly conductive of the aquifer of the Snake Plain and host the, the aquifer. The older uh, tertiary group rocks are typically uh, lower permeability and create uh, an impermeable boundary. Lake Idaho was about 150 miles long, extended, clear, uh, mapped uh, well uh, in, in theory and mapped in this uh, publication to almost Jerome area and Twin Falls uh, in this blue area. We're gonna look at this area here. There was a sequence of um, caldera events, uh, volcanic fields that occurred across Southern Idaho which is now underneath Yellowstone. 
And the Twin Falls area one occurred uh, about 13 million years ago. Lake Idaho about five to one and a half million years ago. And um, so this, again, just a reminder, we're now gonna start a sequence of uh, uh, fun photos, let's say from Niagara down along these springs uh, to Bancroft. And so valley filling basalts, some of the characters of valley filling basalts is when the QT contact, quaternary tertiary contact is very low in elevation, you get very high cliff faces. And here we have blocky uh, quaternary basalt, younger basalt uh, deposited on top of bedded, brecciated pillows uh, in, that filled an, an ancient canyon. That's about 80 foot cliff face right there. And down at Niagara Springs, um, uh, uh, the QT contact is very low. So you get a very high wall in the canyon and um, the talus slope is a little bit lower. And then on the left, conversely, is a high QT contact where you have a very short uh, cliff face and a very long run out of talus. And this, these are the brown tertiary basalts. They tend to be brown, more dense, and then the overlying more gray colored uh, quaternary younger basalts. And as you can see um, in, in other slides, these tertiary sediments and basalts tend to almost have a convex um, weathered surface or profile in the canyon wall. Um, and we'll see that in some other photos. And we move up to Clear Springs grade a little further west. There's a nice exposure in the road cut of the underlying brown tertiary basalts and the overlying gray um, quaternary basalts. And this, there's a nice contact here that we've mapped with survey, uh, laser surveying equipment uh, with Idaho Power Support and National Park Service support. And then um, map that uh, uh, contact that dips about 10 feet uh, in the exposure to the north. Again, down uh, in this area of Clear Springs, uh, we have tertiary basalt exposed. Uh, the QT contact is high in elevation in this area, so there's a short cliff face. And typically few to no springs uh, where the QT contact is very high, and typically few or no pillows exposed either. A little further west of Clear Springs is the old Clear Springs grade. And here again, very short uh, quaternary geology um, on top and uh, uh, this is the tertiary basalt underneath and they weather much differently. Um, so we start looking at the model and comparing them. This outcrop is located at real high QT contact and this outcrop here is located at real low QT contact and Clear Springs is lo located in low and Niagara Springs in a low. Um, we look at Manberry Springs and, and uh, Blind Canyon and Box Canyon here in the next few slides. Blind Canyon Springs has a uh, contact exposure of the Glens Ferry sediments. There's a tertiary, so you can have tertiary lake sediments or tertiary basalts, uh, both of which are low permeability typically. And the, this is the uh, bottom of the aquifer for the ESPA at Blind Canyon Springs that are issuing out. Um, fairly high cliff face here. This is kind of a medium elevation along with some fossils that came out of that exposure. Um, Box Canyon um, also has a QT contact in the foreground as tertiary basalts with some tephra material underneath. And if you look up the canyon to the east here, if you notice on the right side of the canyon, there's a lot of springs discharging or issuing from the talus. Uh, and thus the green vegetation. Conversely, on the south side, essentially no springs are issuing from the talus except down along the base. There's a few at the river level. And so it says that that contact is dipping um, from right to left in this photo. And uh, that contact continues over to the Blue Lakes, uh, Blue Park Springs rather. This is a valley filling basalt. Again, real high cliff face. And then over here, it becomes a very short cliff face of the same salt uh, because it's resting on top of the tertiary uh, contact. Uh, so we have the QT with very short height in the cliff face. Um, 
and Blue Heart Springs issues from down low, actually below river level at this location. So these valley filling basalts really become evident from henceforward. At the top of Blind Canyon grade is, uh, here's a 3D model with some uh, photo correlations is located right here. This is at land surface or Glens Ferry formation that crops out, creates a high and Blind Canyon uh, Glens Ferry sediments located in this area and Box Canyon creates a low in that QT contact and that's a lot of springs and discharge area in that area. We're looking to the east uh, and there's no vertical exaggeration on this plot. Uh, but this plot is two times vertical exaggeration and we'll take a look at uh, here's Harold Maldi's um, canyon filling route number four which matches our modeling efforts of the Q, low QT contact. And also this is about two and a half miles distance between Break Spring and Blue Heart Spring, just for some scale. We're again looking to the east, but I wanted to point out this area in here where you see kind of a flat area along with some uh, rises in that QT contact. And when we add the 2013 water table map of the ESPA, it also creates a basically a peninsula that flattens in the contours, gradient flattens in this area, kind of a table feature. And so we did a dye tracer test years ago from a well back here at about three miles distance. And that dye traveled west to Banbury Springs and Brake Springs, but it split. And it wasn't until we started looking at the subsurface geology that we gained some evidence that the reason it split is because we had a high QT contact of low K permeability influence the split of that dye tracer test. We also have a little half mile trace over here at Clear Springs. These are projected uh, in 3D. And then we had a couple of little uh, isolated hits of fluorescein dye over in Box Canyon. It'd be nice to repeat that trace and uh, try to confirm that. Uh, Harold Stearns in 36 identified this uh, canyon filling basalt, which means a low QT contact. Um, and um, that was, uh, uh, in Maldi's route number four. This is an air photo of that canyon filling basalt in here. And um, on the bottom, you can see a little profile of uh, the exposure of that canyon filling basalt. The tertiary sediments are located over here to the left, brown basalts, and the quaternary high permeable, more recent basalts that filled that canyon are located here. And then day blue um, with the uh, uh, took a trip to Kansas and he, and he texted me, he said, I found the QT contact in Kansas back here on the lower left. So we'll just keep mapping that. Uh, we moved to Thousand Springs. Um, Thousand Springs has structural control in addition to sedimentary control and bedding control. And so you, you can see the dipping of tertiary bed sediments in, right here above the springs. These are some more of the dipping uh, sediments here. And then behind the Thousand Springs power plant, you can see the dipping sediments exposed, the tertiary older stuff with the quaternary younger basalts up above. Uh, Russell in 192 identified this uh, feature up here on page 165. And he, this is the dipping beds that Russell was identifying here where the basalt is dipping into the Hagerman Valley. And then if you notice up here on the skyline, there's some more horizontal basalts up here. So if we look at that on a 3D uh, 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 image here of the ground surface, this is the Thousand Springs complex, which is probably a fault related uh, structure, maybe a hinge fault or a fault associated with monocline that's mapped on the south side of the river. It could be a relay ramp structure, um, but something has caused that block to fall and groundwater as well as lava flows are both following down this ramp uh, or tilted bed structure, and then daylighting out uh, at, uh, as Thousand Springs, the groundwater gradient we've mapped right down that ramp structure also. Then we move back to the background where there was horizontal basalts. We're kind of back up on top to current tunnel. Stearns in 36 identified this location as uh, also eroding into possible lake beds and sediments in the effective base of the ESPA aquifer is at this elevation of 3150 uh, underneath our lake bed sediments. 
uh, and um, uh, on the order of 300 feet thick in this area. Typically blocky basalt that overlies the brecciated pillow zone, uh, which then will lie on top of the um, uh, tertiary sediments. In this image, this is Bader Grade nearby. In the background over here are 600 feet of Glens Ferry tertiary lake bed sediments. In the foreground here at Bader Grade on the east side of Hagerman Valley, uh, there's a number of homes in this area and they have drilled wells through about 62 feet of cap uh, quaternary basalt and then into tertiary sediments that are on the order of 300 feet thick. And then uh, their wells are open in basalts, um, uh, tertiary basalts underneath these sediments. So quite deep, they had to go deep to get water in this area. We found fossils and uh, bivalves, little leaves and otter coprolites in this outcrop. And that outcrop is located right here. And you see these number of control points all kind of grid space. That's because homes are built on that. That's at land surface and Bader grade located here. Current tunnel is issuing from a low in the QT contact. And there's a number of other low uh, areas in the QT contact where other springs issue out or break over basically a pass or saddle in the QT contact. Um, so that, uh, brings uh, some information for a cross section to put together. This is the Bader grade again. These are a bunch of those domestic wells that penetrated 62 feet, 300 feet of Glens Ferry sediments and then terminated in underlying tertiary sediments. And then there are other wells that are just shallow in just the quaternary basalt. And then east of that is a USGS well, 600 feet deep. They penetrated a couple, this is not to scale. Uh, 200 feet of Glens Ferry sediments and then overlying quaternary basalts. And then uh, the uh, well that uh, Whitehead and RASA program uh, drilled about eight miles distance, also penetrated about 175 feet of Glens Ferry formation sediments, as well as quaternary uh, sediments and, and other deposits for a confirmation of that. So you can see 600 feet on the west side of the valley and it's thinning eastward. And this probably extends um, into the Jerome area and causes a major hydrogeologic uh, boundary in, in the vertical sense of the aquifer. The ESPA is flowing across the top through the quaternary. And so we have to be really careful about using wells in modeling exercises that are actually completed in this lower system, which has been done in previous years many times. And, and combining those water levels with uh, wells from really the ESPA proper uh, in, uh, in this area. So, uh, and that's supported by the geology, the hydrologic analysis for correlation, uh, some chemical data from USGS, uh, as well as some temperature differences and stuff. So, and down in Hagerman Valley, we've got uh, uh, some artesian conditions. This is a westward looking model, land surface located here, greatly exaggerated, uh, a truncated, clipped uh, water table map here and the QT surface, just showing how it uh, rises up above the water table in places and of course down below and others. So if we move towards uh, the uh, north a little bit and towards Malad Gorge, this is Maldives Canyon route number two, which matches our modeling also, and um, uh, uh, in addition, here's a bunch of these little small springs and, and some uh, scale here is four miles distance uh, across this area. Uh, this is one of the little small uh, springs that comes out um, that's fairly high in nature along that QT contact. Frank Irwin gave me a call when he uh, intersected that contact years ago. Um, sometimes there's tunneling in along that contact to in, uh, enhance uh, flow out of the aquifer. And Frank uh, had a track hoe, and so that's also it's pretty nice to have somebody friends with track hoes to uh, expose uh, and pull out nice blocks of samples of Glens Ferry formation for that QT contact confirmation. And he also gave me a call when they were working on the Florence Spring Tunnel, where they tunnel in, this is the overlying uh, quaternary basalts and the underlying Glens Ferry formation lake bed sediments right in the floor of this tunnel. And uh, we exposed those and then um, penetrated them with hand auger methods for about 20 feet 
and then use lasers to survey in the elevations for control and GPS at this location. So we're at Malad Gorge now. This is um, Maldi's uh, number two canyon uh, located here. And these are the bedded uh, brescia and uh, uh, pillow basalts. There's a person standing here for scale. And this is again, high um, cliff face where we have canyon filling basalts. And there's a nice little house down here at the bottom of the talus slope. And there's a nice uh, outcrop of tertiary Glens Ferry formation there at the mouth of the canyon. And a cross section that was generated in uh, 2011 um, uh, shows how those sediments extend from the west side of the Hagerman Valley across the Snake River to the east and a possible uh, scenario for understanding uh, those sediments uh, as uh, uh, an aquifer um, uh, tertiary contact with the QT. And so um, this is the location of that uh, previous slide, Malad Gorge. And when you add the wa 2013 water table service, and I use the 2013 water table because it's a high res resolution water table where we map, uh, measured about 200 wells in a small area. And uh, our other, other water table maps uh, don't have that resolution. Uh, and so they don't show a bench feature in the water table in this area, which is right where Maldi's Canyon is in, at this location. So you see the flattening of the water table, uh, if I back up, right in this canyon filling area. So we did some dye tracing here many years ago, a three mile trace that basically went right down the canyon to Malad Gorge and another short trace over from this direction, which is also consistent with the QT model uh, along with the water table map and Maldi's mapping in this area. So this is a different perspective. This is from clear down by Bliss area now and we're looking back. We started our springs, Niagara here and Clear Springs and Briggs and Banbury and um, the, the Thousand Springs faulted block area here and some scale here for distances and our groundwater traces here in green uh, and another groundwater trace over here at Banbury and Briggs in green. These uh, are, this is Maldi's uh, route number two for uh, Buried Canyon uh, and it matches our uh, uh, computer modeling of that surface, as well as some of his routes three and four. And you notice how high the QT contact comes up at Bliss, which is kind of problematic in understanding some things down in that area. This is actually land surface. People are building homes right here, as well as up here to the north. And we're looking to the southeast in this uh, image. So Maldi found uh, a buried uh, a canyon, that ancient canyon that was filled with uh, a McKinney basalt, which is only 50,000 years old, roughly. And this is the location of that canyon filling basalt uh, with a lot of great thickness of brecciated uh, pillows uh, that go right down to the Bliss Reservoir uh, water surface. This is the QT contact with the older uh, brown colored uh, basalts in here and uh, of tertiary age and then the younger quaternary age of the McKinney basalt. And there's springs uh, here um, uh, because this is probably a losing section of the river uh, and there's probably the reservoir and river is actually leaking into, and this is Maldi's uh, theory also, uh, into this brecciated material into the groundwater system. This is just downstream from Bliss. Uh, I should have got a scale on this, but this is at least a mile uh, in width here, I'm guessing. Um, I should have measured that. But uh, regardless, um, uh, as we look at an earlier photo, I found this 1946 air photo from the US Geological Survey. This is pre-dam, uh, so the Bliss Dam had not been constructed, and you see the rapids in the Snake River and that brecciated material in the photo um, that's not in the PowerPoint because you can see it better in the raw photo. Uh, these uh, brecciated pillow features appear to go clear down to the river level. So this can, what that means is this Paleo Canyon, along with the Stearns Canyon we saw earlier, um, uh, was deeper than the current 
uh, canyon that is cut in the Snake River. And so um, this is probably a losing stretch uh, where the river is contributing water to the groundwater system uh, just west of Bliss. And this is the 3D model showing that low canyon area that we just saw right here. It's uh, Maldi's Canyon Route number five, which also is consistent with our 3D ma mapping uh, in this area for this low area of the QT contact or an ancient canyon that's been filled by a basalt later in time. And then uh, Maldi's uh, route travels from that basically inlet of uh, surface water to the groundwater system down to Bancroft. And uh, that's about 10 miles distance from Bancroft Springs up to the Bliss area. And, um, and then uh, right here, there's some other good contacts, uh, the Bliss Dam Grade Road, which has um, uh, Tuana Gravel Formation, which is part of the, uh, uh, the tertiary sediments uh, um, uh, and, and the basically represents the draining of Lake Idaho and the rivers are starting to flow in across the Glens Ferry Formation. And then uh, the younger McKinney Basalt, which is only about 50,000 years um, uh, sitting right on top of that. And this has all of course been mapped by all the entities that have been done mapping in this area. And it's located uh, roughly uh, at here at this road grid. So Bancroft Springs, this is the last spring, the furthest to the west, um, has really been a problem for a number of years and um, really many individuals, including Maldi, uh, really don't know what to do with Bancroft because it's out of, a little bit out of character than the other springs. And it is a canyon filling um, basalt, um, the Kinney basalt, uh, Quaternary age, pretty young. Uh, resting right on top of tertiary age sediments. And um, <clears throat> it's difficult to get into. The access is very uh, difficult. And so many previous mappers and researchers probably did not directly uh, on the foot access this spring area, but rather like this, um, tried to map the geology and contact from, uh, uh, from a distance. Uh, I would surmise anyway, and because um, one of the things Maldi states in his 1971 report on page F19 is that the Bancroft Springs, um, uh, he basically says, will remain a mystery until some drilling penetrates and conceals the lava dam west of Bliss and reveals its character. And one of the reasons is because the discharge of Bancroft is uh, oddly low. It's only about 17 CFS measured by Kilstrom in, back in, I think, 71. Um, uh, and so it's like, well, if this is a, a, a real low QT contact and very permeable in the base, how come you know, we don't have a Niagara Springs or Clear Springs or you know, these large discharge springs coming out at Bancroft? And why is it just a piddly little 17 C CFS? And so um, it's been, it's a tough one to deal with. This photo was taken uh, back in 2008. <clears throat> Some of these individuals would have retired and, or moved on. And, but in 2021, uh, Idaho Power uh, provided uh, um, uh, opportunity for uh, IDWR staff to go in and take a look at Bancroft Springs. And, um, and so I took them up on that, uh, uh, offer and uh, and uh, couldn't get anybody else to go. Um, so we got some direct on the ground access to Bancroft, and um, uh, and we were able to identify some good information. We did measure some flows at 19 CFS, which is about uh, what uh, Kilstrom measured in in 1971. These are some Glens Ferry sediments, uh, lake bed sediments, tertiary age, right around the corner, really just a couple miles to the south of Bancroft. And then some tertiary basalts that were mapped uh, also that are right next to Bancroft. And so the, uh, the tertiary is uh, exposed around Bancroft. And then so uh, Dane Bates with Idaho Power uh, and I were they're measuring some flow rates uh, in a jungle 
and um, <clears throat> and he uh, found a, an outcrop that has not been mapped by anybody, and it's uh, Glensferry Lake bed sediments, of uh, the Glensferry Formation, Tertiary Age. Uh, it's deep in the uh, uh, stratigraphy, so this is pushing probably on the order of five million years old, and um, here he is pulling out some nice carbonaceous paper shale units from Bancroft. And, um, and of course we uh, took a closer look at those uh, sediments and explored the uh, character of the outcrop more and GPS that. And that uh, means that the effective base of this aquifer is uh, at the moment uh, the best that we can uh, determine at uh, 2538 elevation. This is above the Snake River. And so um, all of the spring water is issuing across this uh, dense, uh, silty clay, upward pining floodplain facies of the uh, Glens Ferry Formation. Uh, this is some more photos of the carbon uh, fossils and uh, it should be rich in pollen. And we're trying to get some analysis done for some pollen allergy uh, uh, to see what we can do. When it dries up, it uh, cleaves out and literally kind of paper uh, layers, and that's why they call it a carbonaceous black paper shale uh, capping, which caps, typically caps uh, upward finding um, uh, floodplain units uh, with uh, silty, silty clays underlying them. No biggie, just a little video, water torn out, and um, some of the uh, sediments exposed here. And Dane's just trying to show some layering and sedimentology underneath the waterfall. No biggie. So one of the problems we have with Bancroft Springs here in the lower left is how does water get to Bancroft? And if it is river water, is it solely river water that's making its way through a buried canyon and uh, we don't have any control for the QT contact at this location. So it, uh, it's possible that canyon or low extends right through this saddle down to Bancroft. And so maybe that's the source of water uh, to Bancroft. And so uh, Idaho Power has uh, um, supported um, collecting uh, some water chemistry samples. So we're looking at some water chemistry to look at fingerprints, chemical fingerprints of this spring compared to river water or the ESPA water from over here. And we're in progress of that. And nobody's really ever measured Bancroft, so we don't really have any hydrographs that we can look at. And there's very few wells between Bliss and Bancroft, um, but there are a few. So in this uh, image here, you'll see the QT contact uh, uh, without contour lines. And then the 2018, East Snake Plain Aquifer water table map with contour lines. And you can see how up towards Bliss, it is cutting uh, quite deep underneath these sediments uh, through the lake bed sediments essentially. And at Bliss, there's 500 feet of a complete exposure of the Lake Idaho um, Glens Ferry sediments. The Tuana gravel lays right on top of this ridge and they're coring it out for gravels. So we have the complete deposit of uh, in excess of 500 feet of lake bed sediments that extend down through this um, vertically. So if the ESPA is making its way through sediments completely, um, then it could be, or are we getting a combination of uh, ESPA water and uh, Snake River water, which is making its way on down? Or is there another canyon uh, and we don't have uh, control points right at this saddle. Is there another buried canyon of basalt and therefore the ESPA is traveling through basalt all the way on down to Bancroft? It's a good question and nobody really knows for sure, uh, but it is problematic in, our, in some of our mapping um, uh, because if the ESPA is traveling or flowing through 
uh, 500 feet of silty clay lake bed sediments, you would think we, we would see uh, some tightening of the groundwater contours if you embrace the Darcy equation for, uh, for that. Uh, but we don't really have any control uh, for groundwater contours. And so if we wanna extend this ESPA water table map to, from Bancroft to Bliss, we really need to get some groundwater uh, measurements for control in between. And so um, at this point in time, it's my sense that uh, Bancroft Springs is not part of the ESPA uh, and that uh, there's more evidence that supports that it's not part of the ESPA system and therefore not part of the model domain uh, in this area and that we really need to take a hard look at um, uh, uh, investigating this area better to include it or exclude it from modeling exercises or and also understanding Bancroft Springs um, uh, uh, more in its character and whatnot for uh, other reasons like um, endangered species and stuff like that or that are in the king. So I think uh, with that, I smoked right through it and I think I even got done a, faster than I thought I would. And um, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to fire away. All right, thank you so much. What a, what a puzzle and uh, what a dream for a hydrogeologist to work on. And uh, we actually do have a question in Moscow. Um, yeah, I was wondering about the uh, groundwater ages of the springs, if you could elaborate it. I had to turn my volume up. Uh, could you repeat that question? Yeah, um, I was wondering about the groundwater ages of the springs, if any samples, if any like age dating samples were collected, um, their similarities exist between springs. And the same um, I, I think there has been some age dating of, of the water. Uh, we're not currently um, looking at that yet, but we do want to look at that. I'd have to defer to somebody else that may be listening that might have more information about age dating of the water. Um, I do know that our groundwater traces, um, and not all of them are shown here. Um, this is a three mile trace uh, here at, uh, uh, at this location. That just took, uh, um, you know, what groundwater is traveling on the order of, you know, if days there help, help me with my memory. Um, I think that's uh, on the order of a thousand feet per day for groundwater velocities and, and the same up in this area. Uh, very high groundwater velocities uh, on the order of 500 to a thousand feet per day on our three mile traces. Uh, we have a 32 mile trace that uh, started east of uh, Wendell um, <clears throat> and, and is, is discharging down here at uh, 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 Box Springs. And that's 32 mile distance, and that uh, just took two years to travel 32 years, uh, 32 miles. So uh, groundwater is moving at high rates uh, uh, at numerous locations, and um, so I, <clears throat> uh, it'd be interesting to see what age dating shows versus what our groundwater tracing velocities show. That's a that's a very good question. Hey, Neil, this is Lewis. Um, so on a, a question, uh, mile post 31 and mile post 28, I think you've done traces there. Um, and also the Wilson Canyon, what are your numbers on those uh, for your miles of travel when they when you did the traces? Uh, I, I just noted um, mile post 31 is 32 miles. Wilson Trace is still in progress and we don't have results on that one. And we didn't do a trace at milepost 29. Good. Got one more question in Moscow. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering if there's been any efforts to map recharge zones, uh, looking at like the watershed scale um, to map recharge zones to see how like shifting precipitation inputs or long-term patterns are affecting spring discharge? 
I believe those efforts are being uh, entertained and active in our modeling committee group. And uh, I would defer that question to them. Um, any other questions? And please don't forget to unmute yourself or uh, you can also type the question in the chat window. Hi, my name is Mel. Um, I have a question just out of curiosity. Um, reading into your background, it looked like you had a lot of uh, experience with paleontology research. And I was wondering what steered you toward a career in, in like hydrology with the Idaho Department of Water Resources instead of uh, paleontology? Yeah, that's, a, that's kind of a good question. Basically what happened is I uh, was uh, studying my master's thesis on uh, perched aquifers that were causing landslides at the Hagerman Fossil Beds National Monument. And so uh, by association uh, working for the monument, I gained a lot of uh, field experience with paleontology. Uh, so I worked for the fossil beds for 11 years. And um, so that's how that uh, uh, evolved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's a question. Hey, in the Neil, this is Lewis again. <laughs> um, what traces are, is the IDWR going to do on the upper valley? for the recharge? Um, we've got a number of traces uh, uh, that have been uh, in planning stages. And so we're in, on, undergoing those preparations and uh, it's kind of in flux at, a, at the moment, you know, given that uh, we're now in drought situation, but um, uh, they're forthcoming in, in our planning stages. Okay, thanks. Fantastic. I see that uh, Roy from the USGS sort of added a, a comment for you. Uh, let me see if I can find that. That, that was in response to the age dating question the, uh, the person had earlier. Um, oh, thank Neil, you. Neil Plummer and Mike Rupert did some age dating in the Magic Valley for uh, part of an aqua study in the in the early 2000s, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if they did any uh, dating of the springs themselves, but there is a lot of low-level tritium, and, and we did do some isotopes on five of the springs, or, or several of the springs, I guess, um, in, in some papers in the 90s um, that could give you relative ages of, of the different spring water in, in, in the area. Thank you. I really appreciate chiming in. Any other questions for Neil? All right, well, that doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you so much for a very informative talk. I've learned a lot about the area. Uh, so thank you. We will uh, reconvene next week and we'll talk about uh, water markets next week. So thank you so much. And thank you for participating in the seminar series. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yay.